You know, I'm not sure what's more sad, that HBO's leaving Neverland narcolepsy remedy went ahead despite confirmed disinformation festooned the fuck throughout omnipresent timeline discrepancies and long debunked hearsay, or that a video I recorded before I'd even fucking seen it preemptively decimated almost every word of it sight unfucking seen. As such, a third part of the Michael Jackson rebuttal was almost outright needless, and it might not have existed at all, if not for the fucking reaction. I confess, I'd forgotten what blathering fucking sheep human beings can be. It's been so long since the prolonged media-mongering shit show of 2005, the fallout of which, for the record, was much more intense toward Michael Jackson than what we're currently experiencing, and thus I'd caution both MJ fans, disbelievers, and blog hump and hacks alike to dial it the fuck down with the Michael Jackson is finally done articles, when frankly Michael Jackson ain't half as done as he was in 2005, and three years later, he was in full comeback mode. Hyperbole's a bitch. I ought to know. It's the source of my power. That said, it's a testament to the manipulative power of documentaries as a fucking format, however, that the dearth of evidence presented in Leaving Neverland, a documentary that documents absolutely nothing and features little apart from the same two accusers telling unconfirmable anecdotes for four fucking hours, in no way precluded even those who fancy themselves journalistic goddamn gumshoes from declaring that four hours of mood lighting, piano music, and goddamn drone shots can conceivably stand in for substantive fucking evidence. And most recently, Lil Ben Shapiro decided a mountain of countervailing evidence, two grand jury dismissals, and a courtroom exoneration on 14 fucking counts wasn't quite enough to overcome Wade Robson's aggressively contradictory, distemporal fucking fantasy yarn. Yeah, that's just a normal human tendency. We tend to make snap judgments about people, and then we take those judgments too far and we generalize more broadly. Well, Michael, two things are true of Michael Jackson. Immensely talented human being, evil pedophile, right? <laughs> Those two things are, are true of Michael Jackson, at least if the allegations are to be believed, which all evidence suggests they should be. Yeah, what immutable evidence would that be, Ben, that Gimme Safe Cuck's mother claims in the documentary you claim you goddamn watched that she, quote, danced when she heard of Michael's death in 2009? I danced when I heard that he died. I was laying in bed, the news came on, I got out of bed, and I was, oh, thank God, he can't hurt any more children. Despite her son stating in both a sworn court deposition and in the self-same stink piece, he, quote, never realized he was abused until 2013. He sexually abused me from seven years old until 14. So when you saw Wade on the Today Show, that triggered you to feel what? I panicked, like I was being caught, honestly. Meaning both he and his mother are officially fucking time travelers? And hey, maybe there's something to that time traveler hypothesis, because Safechuck alleges his abuse intensified after a Grammy Award performance in 1989 in New York, despite the Grammys being held in Los Angeles that year, where Michael Jackson never once performed, by the by. All signs point to believe, do they, Benzo? And people are having a really tough time connecting those two. They're having a really tough time overcoming the cognitive dissonance of I like Michael Jackson's music and I was a big fan of his when I was 10 with Michael Jackson was an evil human being who preyed upon children. How fucking old is this Aspie? Anybody above the age of a zygote remembers the 2005 fucking funnel cloud of TV and print propaganda alleging everything from hidden rape dungeons to sophisticated pedophilia networks, all of which fucking all of it being presented in a court of law and all 14 counts of which he was fucking exonerated of. Ben, buddy, four of those counts were fucking misdemeanors. If one half of what was said in court, let alone in this laugh riot of a schlockumentary, had actually been factual, Michael would have at least been guilty of one of the misdemeanor counts of child endangerment. Yet for all your pronouncements that Michael paid his way out of prison, in a trial that was scheduled for five months, he was cleared in fucking four. Not just not guilty, not goddamn guilty. And Michael was still routinely identified with criminal kitty rape and broader entertainment media thereafter. Yet you're alleging people are reticent? They're having a tough time believing the bullshit accusations? On what planet and in what fucking solar system? Time Warner, CNN, ABC, MSNBC, Oprah, BBC, sources you routinely discredit for self-evident bias. All of these sources were slavering at the prospect of at last lynching Michael Jackson for the crime of which he has since been cleared. And 
that's without even indulging in naming the unremitting procession of unctuous obliviati, parroting what amounts to four hours of fucking anecdotes, absent actual evidence. This enraging film by Dan Reed inspired a lawsuit against the pay cable channel from Jackson's estate, which desperately wants people not to see a story that may significantly diminish the value of his brand. It's a wonder there's any brand left to defend, given that four men have now made detailed, credible claims that Jackson sexually abused them as minors. <laughs> what detail? Contradictory generalities about a general year and a general place? Look, I can kind of understand it, as on the few occasions Wade does name a specific time and place, it's later found to explicitly contradict what those in Michael's inner circle, never mind his fucking family, already know to be factual. Case in point, the segment near the end of the film, where Wade obliquely alludes to Michael Jackson having a possible alcohol problem, as Mike allegedly simply left the dinner table and the children all to their goddamn lonesome. We had some, um, those sort of larger red plastic cups, and he grabbed one of those and just filled one up to the brim, you know, with white wine. And Michael says, you know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go upstairs for a second. 30 minutes goes by. An hour goes by, um, you know, nothing from Michael. He never comes back down. So Amanda and I are like, what do we, <laughs> you know, what do we do? And I remember asking the kids, like, like, do you want to go check on on your dad? I mean, he's okay. And Robson alleges it was this dinner that gave him the moral motivation to lie in court in 2005, under oath, despite a withering cross-examination by the prosecution. The problem? Dan Reed flagrantly edited the sequence to exclude the other people present. One of their names? Taj fucking Jackson, Michael's nephew. Who says it's a heap and help and a horseshit, by the way? Oh, but Taj is simply defending his dead uncle, you say. Well, once again, Wade has run afoul of the gods of time, as the dinner in question took place after he'd fucking testified in 2005. Surprise! <laughs> what about Wade Robson claiming Michael Jackson gave him the thriller jacket? even though it was actually kept by costume designer Demis Tompkins and auctioned off for $1.8 million to a random rich dude from Austin in 2011. Or James Safechuck claiming he was given Indiana Jones' bullwhip, even though there's only one bullwhip and it was donated to the Institute of Archaeology in London in 1990. Or Safechuck again, claiming he honeymooned with Michael at Euro Disney in 1988, even though Euro Disney didn't even open until 1992, which is during a time Gimme Safecut claims Michael was no longer speaking to him. He had been, I think, a little absent from my life. And then he's back in it because he needs you for something. He needs you to testify. So honestly, you're like happy that he's back. <laughs> Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs! Oprah better double-pack that audience with sexual assault survivors next time. Maybe maybe if she clenches real hard and glues her lassie wig down extra tight, it'll drown out the endless procession of basic timetable discrepancies with a wall of fucking feelings. Feel. You feel. Feel. Triggered. Feel. 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 Not me too. Feeling. Raped. See people with tears in the audience. My heart melted. Crying. Feel. Felt. Feels. 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 Feel. 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 Feeling. Feel. How do you feel about that? That's a tough one. You'll remember that in 1995, he settled a civil suit for a reported $23 million after being accused of sexual abuse by Jordan Chandler. Which, as I've already explained many times, is a happy byproduct of California law, which at that time ludicrously allowed a civil suit to be filed in advance of a criminal one. Meaning Michael Jackson's legal team would not only have had to prepare for a twin fucking defense against simultaneous, salacious court cases that would already be tried in media, but who, with a functioning fucking medulla, would motherfucking believe a civil case, even one that would have found Michael Jackson innocent, would not irreparably bias a prospective criminal jury against the goddamn defendant? Even if he won, and he would have, the jury in the criminal case would have been biased from the get-go simply because the civil suit existed at all. Michael's legal team begged the judge in 94 to postpone the proceeding until after the criminal case case, as any rational being would assume it already would have been, and they were refused six separate 
times. And through all Shapiro's shrieking about payoffs, what the National Review's retardation showcase fails to fucking mention is that settling a civil case does not dispose of the criminal one. All the evidence in the case was already collected at that point, including nude photographs of Michael Jackson, the victim's sworn descriptions of his genitals, which, contrary to popular belief, must not have matched the genuine article, as the prosecution elected not to fucking enter them into evidence. Fucking oops. Unsurprisingly, in 1994, two separate grand juries decided not only was there not enough evidence to convict, there wasn't even enough evidence to indict. Since August 1993, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department, the Santa Barbara District Attorney's Office, and the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office have been investigating allegations of child abuse involving singer Michael Jackson. That investigation is now complete. The young boy who was, who was the catalyst for this investigation has recently informed us that he does not wish to participate in any criminal proceeding where he is named as a victim. We must decline prosecution involving Mr. Jackson. But they got no evidence. This is the There is no corroborating evidence. They impaneled a grand jury in Santa Barbara. Now, a grand jury can indict this remote control unit if it wants to. You don't need hardly anything to get an indict. Indict a ham sandwich, for crying out loud. There was no evidence. But how many of you have been thinking Michael Jackson was guilty for the whole year simply because the press had all these people? Uh, cops raid Michael Jackson's homes, Peter Pan, or pervert, pop star in sex probe. The, uh, for the whole year since this thing came up, the American people have assumed Michael Jackson's guilty because the press has assumed he's guilty. It's an accusation for which there's no defense. The minute the accusation's leveled, you're guilty. But remember Shapiro's own words, kiddies. At least if the allegations are to be believed, which all evidence suggests they should be. But wait, it gets better. During his criminal trial, Jackson urged both Safechuck and Robeson, now adults, to testify he had done nothing inappropriate with them. Safechuck simply declined, and in his silence, he incurred Jackson's wrath. He threatened me with, my, with his lawyers and said I had perjured myself years ago. He recalls, the lawyers would get me. He says Jackson told him. Putting aside that Scott Ross, the private investigator employed by the defense to cross-examine prospective witnesses, namely his statement this past week that Safechuck was not only never asked to testify in 2005, he was, quote, a non-entity. Motions in limine are to prevent things coming in that are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Safechuck, there was a declaration filed, I think, sometime in 93 or 94, 95, whatever, somehow in connection with the Jordy Chandler matter. And Safechuck had signed a declaration saying that, yeah, nothing happened. Michael never did anything, blah, blah, blah. He no longer had contact with Michael. And so Safechuck, for purposes of the trial, was a, what we would call a non-entity. The judge had already ruled nothing regarding Safechuck was going to be allowed. Nothing was going to be discussed. Um, no evidence one way or the other. Safechuck, for purposes of this trial, didn't exist. So when I hear these stories that Evi Tavashi, who was Michael's personal assistant for 20 some odd years, was calling Safechuck repeatedly and begging him to testify. And he asked me to testify. And um, I said no. And he got really angry at me. He threatened me with his lawyers and said that I had perjured myself years ago and that he has the best lawyers in the world and that they were going to get me. And I just said, I, just, I don't want any part of it. You'll hear nothing from me. The, it's not even absurdity. The stupidity of that comment is beyond belief simply based on the fact that it's not up to Evi Tavashi to decide who's going to testify. It wasn't even up to Tom. It wasn't even up to Snedden at that point. At that point, the judge had already long since ruled, well over seven, eight months before, that Safe Check was a non entity. Ben Joe, didn't you graduate from goddamn Harvard? How is it possible you're not aware that a judge in a criminal case approves court witnesses? 
well in motherfucking advance. How could Michael Jackson beg Gimme Safe Cuck to cock a doodle do in court, let alone incur his righteous wrath for not fucking doing so, if, as Safe Chuck himself alleges in the documentary, the court case was already ongoing? That isn't how court cases work, kid! Didn't you go to school for this shit? More to the point there, paralegal eagle. Why in world-rending fuck would he want two kids he kitty fuck to be witnesses in his trial, and thus subject to cross-examination, during which they could easily break the fuck down and goddamn incriminate him, particularly when defense lawyer Tom Mesereau has gone on record as stating, if Wade didn't want to do it, someone else could have. And that the only reason they put Robson first was because after six years of estrangement, Robson himself had volunteered to tee up against the prosecution. In fact, it was precisely this gung-ho attitude that persuaded Mesereau Robson was the logical choice for a fucking leadoff hitter. And if you put on a defense case in a criminal trial, you always want to start with a powerful witness. He was very powerful for us. He said that nothing untoward had ever happened, and then he withstood a very powerful cross-examination by a very seasoned prosecutor, and Wade Robson never changed his position. That's why it's so absurd, because <laughs> Wade Robson wasn't going to take the stand if he couldn't get through me. Wade Robson had to, first had to get through me, then he had to get through Susan and Tom, then he had to get through the police, being Sergeant Steve Robel um, and Lieutenant Jeff Clappis. And these two guys are incredibly experienced detectives. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, you know, what I had said before, not to mention when you're under cross-examination, how do you get through the likes of Tom Snedden, Ron Zonin, and Gordon Auchincloss? And the fact is, once we turn over the witness list, they're perfectly capable of doing these interviews, and they did. So again, how is it that Wade Robson, what, he outsmarted all of us? As you should know, as a theoretical lawyer yourself, the first witness for the defense is generally subjected to full court fucking press from the prosecution's cross-examination, particularly when said witness is a young boy, now a man, in a sensationalist molestation trial whose very presence and testimony dismantles the motherfucking narrative. Why put Wade Robson there if he had been fucked when there were, according to Tom Mesereau, dozens of other witnesses who hadn't been allegedly fucking fiddled. Man alive, Michael must have been mighty comfortable in his goddamn grooming practices. Practices Wade Robson describes in his sworn deposition as, quote, a single fucking phone call. Yet said programming was evidently so profound, MJ was willing to risk being hauled off the kitty diddler prison by putting up one of the members of his preteen pooper posse on the witness stand. Well, there are a bunch of lessons to be learned here. Well, some of those lessons include, again, our capacity for cognitive dissonance blinding us to the reality. <laughs> right? Like Big Ben's capacity to believe Wade Robson and James Safechuck lied every single time, except when they stood to gain 1.5 billion butt fucking dollars in a lawsuit. Like believing Wade Robson's ludicrous assertion that, quote, I want to be able to speak the truth as loud as I had to speak the lie for so long despite the carefully fucking omitted fact that he filed his original lawsuit under seal to secure a silent payday. Whoops, Ben, buddy, facts don't give a fuck about your feelings. As for my own viewing, look, I watch live with each and every one of you on Periscope, links for which are in the description, so view them at your leisure, but brace for bullshit regardless, because the long dead dog shit accusations come hard and well, they come hard anyway. What I expected, given the emotionally arresting reaction described by the Sundance viewership, was a deluge of disinformative information I'd have to assess or debunk depending on the validity of the source material. And so, as you saw in part two, I muscled up on my MJ allegation history, I went ahead and read through the entire transcript of Wade Robson's 2005 testimony, and I steeled myself for the fuckery to come. And then, as the conductor raised his hands aloft and the symphony of stupidity warmed up in unison, what emerged was a spider fart. In short, leaving Neverland has nothing, literally nothing, but anecdotes. Gang, that's the evidence. Dudes and their immediate families 
telling stories. Never mind that Wade Robson's on his fourth or fifth fucking version at this point. Never mind that Safe Chuck's on three, closing in on four. This is all the evidence the moving going public requires to reverse course on Michael Jackson for time immemorial. Okay, maybe I should temper that description. As Leaving Neverland, hype notwithstanding, failed to set a matchbook on fucking fire in the ratings category, being outdrawn not only by third string reality shows in its own time slot, but also by the previous night's rerun of a year-old fucking rock film, Skyscraper. Unsurprisingly, on the literally two or three occasions where it does saunter into specifics, it emerges with mountains of inconsistencies. In one harrowing sequence, one director Dan Reed has since admitted was actually filmed in pickups, meaning after filming was formally concluded, James Safechuck miraculously located his childhood wedding ring. One I already pointed out in part two of the MJ rebuttal was originally an accusation called from Victor Gutierrez's book in 97, which was sued for slander and lost. And I say married because we had this mock wedding ceremony and the ring is nice. It has a row of diamonds. It's hard to go back to that moment. No inscription, no possible method of verifying it actually came from Michael Jackson. Just, hey, here's a ring I could have got from K-Jewelers, Walmart, or a goddamn gumball machine. Please believe my ass. Made all the more suspicious by the fact he concedes beforehand that at the same ceremony, he and Michael reportedly filled out wedding vows. We did this in his bedroom, and we, like, filled out some vows. Which... Begs the fucking question, if you kept a kitty fucker's promise ring for 20 plus fucking years, why didn't you do the same for the vows? If Michael kept them, why weren't they among his effects during the surprise raid of Neverland? And so begins a familiar malady. Salacious descriptions of every lurid act under the yellow sun flow freely, and the accusers even take care to include utterly innocuous Polaroids of Michael Jackson chilling in a red shirt, watching TV, playing ping pong, whatever the world rending fuck isn't incriminating, indeed the Robsons and Safe Chucks appear to have assiduously archived every Michael Jackson missive, no matter how innocuous, from birthday greetings to hey what the fuck up phone messages to simple scribbles to say hi, yet remarkably, all the texts and faxes, the phone calls and illicit encounters they allege occurred that might have conceivably provided the faintest fucking substantiation have all been conveniently lost to the rigors of time. A kawinky of a ding dong dink if I've ever heard one. All manner of emotionally manipulative pablum from allegations Michael Jackson massacred his mother's marriage to mock weddings and hotel room reach arounds are exhaustively alleged in vivid four dimensional delineation. Problem is, the proof never comes along for the ride. And for a dead man, not extended the defamation protection afforded the fucking living, let alone one exonerated in record time of 14 fucking counts in court, I'd say that's an itty bitty oversight. In the absence of factual fucking scrutiny, familiar fuckbags have emerged from the woodwork. Bodyguards sued for slander, multiple maids who did likewise, 60 Minutes Australia decided a full fucking hour should be dedicated to Adrian McManus, a member of the infamous Neverland Five, and a woman long since beshitted in court when she claimed Jordan Chandler, Brett Barnes, and Macaulay Culkin had been molested before her very fucking eyes, only for Culkin himself to appear in court and reveal her to be a flagrant fucking liar. Mind you, this was a full decade after she made a sworn statement in 93 that she never witnessed the faintest impropriety from the pop star. Perhaps most damaging of all, Adrian McManus explicitly admitted she was coached and aided at every turn by, you guessed it, our old pal, Victor Gutierrez. Man, that fella gets the fuck around. At Michael Jackson's trial, you were found to have lied under oath. Okay, now I'm gonna explain that. Centering an entire mini documentary around a witness whose credibility was incinerated well over a decade ago. She and four other employees sued the singer for wrongful termination and lost. Do you still owe the Jackson estate money? Um, I, um, I, I pr probably do, but um, Michael's dead now, you know? 
To call him leaving Neverland deceptively edited borders on cartoonishly charitable. At one point, a clip is presented out of context, one I've been hit with repeatedly as evidence of child abuse, wherein Michael is asked what the best thing about Hawaii is, to which he appears to respond with the words, being with James Safechuck. Why, what was your like, best thing? My best thing about Hawaii? Being with you? This is, in fact, clip from a mock interview Safechuck submitted into evidence in his case against the estate in 2013, which, as we all know, was thrown out faster than a W-2 form at Wesley Snipes' house. The problem? If you examine the available court documents, it's abundantly clear the clip's been filleted to fucking shit, as his full response is actually, quote, The best thing about being in Hawaii is spending time with Jimmy and Jimmy's family, and I can't wait to spend more time with... Them. Now, why would Dan Reed, a dehydrated scrotum with an English accent, make a convenient cut right before the fucking part about hanging with the entire family, I wonder? Whatever the reason, I'm certain it's nothing at all to do with the fact that it's featured in a segment where Safe Chuck alleges Michael kept him in isolation from his fucking family. He's working on pushing you away from your parents, or pushing you away from everybody else, and like it's just you and him. You see, for all his vapid platitudes about sparking a debate and spurring a discussion, the truth is, Dan Reed doesn't want the faintest fucking beginnings of scrutiny, not in his film or indeed in his ever-loving life. Because when Diamond Dan at last vacated the U.S. media hug box Oprah painstakingly erected for his feckless ass and returned to gray old England, at long last, he was finally fucking pressed by, of all people, Piers Morgan. Other than what they're saying, did you unearth any actual evidence? You are. I, well, because, is it not true that they're trying to... This isn't sue? about money. This isn't right. what the Michael so Jackson... So they're not suing for money? Well, they're suing for justice. And Do they want money? I don't know. You should ask them. Well, you know. You know the answer. I ask you, how did it take this long for a reporter to dare to broach these basic questions? Folks, when the only journalist actually doing his job is Piers Fucking Morgan, you know the profession is fucked beyond reckoning. Or Reed's further defense of providing only one side of the story, saying anyone with contrary evidence would be, quote, irrelevant. What is, what is the journalistic value of, in, uh, of interviewing someone who says, well, Michael was a really nice guy and he'd never do anything to a child? Particularly if that person has a gigantic vested interest in your know, financial interest. <laughs> Well, fuck bag, when facts are irrelevant, we truly do live in a kangaroo court society. A fuckmire of mass media manipulation long since divested of relevance, but as leaving Neverland to test, still possessing unparalleled destructive influence. For an audience that unflinchingly accept the occasionally unsubstantiated and more often outright disproven allegations in a documentary that repeatedly argues how easy it is for a single individual to manipulate a single child, you sure as shit are quick to turn a blind eye to how easily mass media is playing your witless asses like a fucking viola. And considering said propagandist media tactics are the precise practices alternative media figures like Ben Shapiro or Tim Pool profess to eschew, that's a dangerous habit to indulge further, my friends. Sketchy doesn't begin to cover this cock and bullshit. These allegations are a splatter paint away from being a goddamn Jackson Pollock painting. I'm Razor Fist. God. Fucking speed. Can Wade? Everybody says that you know he testified that Michael did nothing to him. You know, was perfect for you guys, and they say he did this under oath. Can? Charges be brought against him now for perjury, or how would that work? Is that even feasible? When he released his story in 2013, he released it right after the seven year statute of limitations. Wow. So you think he did that on purpose? How convenient. Anyone who's watched me for any length of time knows I'm well estranged from the concept of the postscript. What I record at the moment is generally what the fuck it is, and as such, must stand or fall on its fucking own. Sadly, 
I have to suspend this tradition momentarily due to the unprecedented behavior of the makers of Leaving Neverland, namely its director, Dan Reed. He was cruising along quite comfortably, provided it was only on American outlets, beholden as they bought fucking Arda Oprah and her cowardly lion wig. It was a foregone conclusion he'd be frolicking through a fucking pillow fort in American interviews. And then... He crossed the Atlantic. After being pressed by Piers Morgan, other outlets began to question the veracity of the documentary as well, with Michael's nephew, Taj Jackson, and even its brothers pointing out the self-same timeline discrepancies I itemized in the video you just watched. And wouldn't you know, just in time for the UK airing of the documentary, those segments simply vanished. I felt like I would, you know, I would break. Like, I couldn't be strong, as strong as I needed to be. We had had dinner the night before at Neverland, and he was definitely subdued. So we were at the ranch with all his family. And he was, I mean, he just, he wasn't there. What if he loses? What if he goes to jail? You know, and these are the last couple of times that they see their daddy. Built my conviction even that much more. He wanted to support Michael. To me, it was like, here was his, you know, lifelong friend that just really needed him. Like, I couldn't be strong, as strong as I needed to be. To me, it was like, here was his, you know, lifelong friend. And then... They were gone, such that the full running time of the UK version has actually dropped from the over four hour long version here in America to just three hours and 35 minutes. A mighty corpulent cut for Testimony Variety, National Review, and Daily Wire, not to mention Mr. Shapiro, described as irrefutable. A state I'd suspect HBO might want to do some legwork on, given that they have until the 21st to respond to the Jackson Estates lawsuit, and I suspect the prosecuting attorneys will be up to the homework Dan Reed was too biased or butt-fucking lazy to bother doing. Damage control on a months-old media narrative of this magnitude is like trying to slam a revolving door there, Dr. Evil, because letting the cat out of the bag is a fuck of a lot easier than getting the furry bastard back in. I'm Razor Fist. God fucking speed!